I mean, science can be off-putting. And when people after the cake Bible called me a food scientist, I would cringe because to me that was the antithesis of being thought of as an artist and being creative. But when you know the fundamentals of the ingredients, what's in them, and how things work, you can be as creative as you want to be, and it works. You're listening to The Taste Podcast. I'm senior editor Anna Huesel, and I'm here with editor-in-chief Matt Rodbard. Today on the podcast, we have Rose Levy Berenbaum and her longtime collaborator, Woody Wolston. They're the authors of lots of important baking books, including the newest Rose's Baking Basics. Later on the show, we have Timothy Pakron, author of Mississippi Vegan. But Anna, what did you and Rose and Woody talk about? I was so excited to talk to Rose and Woody because they are the authors of a lot of cookbooks that I kind of grew up with. They wrote the Pie and Pastry Bible, the Cake Bible, the Bread Bible. And Rose writes with such scientific detail that even kind of an idiot who doesn't know anything about baking could pick them up and learn a lot. Is there one recipe that sticks out in your mind from that book? I have such great memories of making her key lime pie from the Pie and Pastry Bible. It's really stuck with me over the years. And there are a lot of things I learned how to do from that. Here's Anna speaking with Rose and Woody. Rose and Woody are the authors of a new cookbook, Rose's Baking Basics, But Rose, you have been writing about baking since 1981. Is that right? About that, yes. I think that was when I first started writing for Cook's Magazine. Are you still learning new tricks? Oh, yeah. Or do you know them all already? I think I do, and then I learn more, (laughs) especially with this book, because we have over 600 step-by-step photos, and we did all of them in my basement kitchen that we recreated out of the basement. We moved there full time. And when you do all the steps yourself, you have to learn new things because you're doing it so fast and you have to get ready for the photographer. So yes, there are lots of new tricks in the book that we've we've highlighted. Plus, on our blog, we put something called, well, in one book it was Outbakes, in the cake book it was Outcakes, and in this one I think it's Outbakes, that are things that we learned after the book went out that we wanted to share, like new recipes that oh. maybe are variations and things like that. What, what are some of the Outbakes from this book? There are two that come to mind right away. One that's on already is the cheesecake, but made as a souffle. So instead of just adding the sugar and the egg whites, um, instead of separating the eggs, in this case, we made an Italian meringue and folded it in. And it's amazing. You have that flavor, but also the texture of a souffle. And the one that's coming out in a few weeks, I think, for the holidays, because it's dependent on the best oranges, is the orange version of the triple uh, triple lemon bundt cake which is my personal favorite cake in the book. And that's a brand new cake that has never been done before. Yeah, so on our website, Real Baking with Rose, we have those outtakes. Also, we have a weekly tips of the tips of baking tips deal where two, uh, some of the things that we learned as we went along that didn't get into the book are on the website as well. That's very cool. So what are some of the new techniques that you learned this time around with this book that didn't make it into previous books? First one that I think is most important is the fact that eggs are no longer the same size, well, the proportion of yolk to white. I've been noticing that for a long time, but now I've learned that by investigating that they're using an industry, they're using younger laying hens for the for the eggs. So that does change the proportion, And whereas you might have an average yolk in the past being over 18 grams, now it could be as little as 12 or 13. So we give a range of eggs, of egg yolks. And of course, if you have more, if you have less yolk, you'll therefore have more white. And I've always said that when you want to beat egg whites and not ever risk overbeating them, you use an eighth of a teaspoon of cream of tartar per egg white. But if the egg white is weighing more, you have to use more than an eighth of a teaspoon. So this, I think, is very critical for people to be aware of. I mean, it's not that we can't decide whether it should be six or ten egg yolks. It's that you really need to either weigh or use the volume. Another really exciting thing is about the flour. Because for pie crust, I've always preferred pastry flour, but you pay more in postage than you do in the flour because it's not available in supermarkets. And I discovered that if you use a national brand of all-purpose flour, either bleached or unbleached, it could be gold medal or King Arthur, but supermarket, not something that's regional, 
you can get the same texture of the pie crust as with the pa- as pastry flour if you add a tablespoon of sugar per egg, per um, the pie crust. So if you're making a double crust pie, it would be two tablespoons. The thing is, it will brown more quickly. So I like mm. to bake it at a slightly lower temperature, like 25 degrees, and you can tent it if it browns. But sometimes you want it to brown more when you're not baking as long a pie. So that was pretty exciting. Another thing, the what you're doing tart pan, the tart pan theory for getting for molding a tart pan. Well, one thing is that it, people inevitably get holes in the crust when they're making a tart. Not always, but often. And it used to be that the conventional wisdom was to seal it with a little egg white, which works really well because egg white is considered the glue of pastry chefs. But it is a glue, and it will glue it to the bottom of the pan. So when you're trying to unmold it or cut slices, it's really hard to get it off in a nice slice. But we now use either white chocolate, depending on what the filling is, if we don't want it to show up, or dark chocolate, so that heat will melt it after it bakes and will fill the hole and seal it. And if you have a really sticky filling, like a pecan pie filling, and you're trying to unmold it and it's stuck to the pan, my most exciting trick, and I never thought of this before, but it was during the step-by-step photos, and I thought, we need to photograph this, and it's not unmolding. When you try to perch it on top of a canister, you know, the tart pan that has two pieces, and you try to heat the bottom of the pan, you can't get to the center of it. Mm. And I thought, well, how do I do that? Ah, Eureka. We take a cake pan, fill it with hot water, empty the water, dry it, invert it, and set the pe- the tart pan on top of it for a minute or so. Oh. And if you need to, you can use a hair dryer to heat it or one of those little kitchen torches. If it's really stuck on there, do it a second time. The, the basic goal is to get the bottom of that tart pan hot so that whatever's stuck to it will unmold. So I'm really wow. thrilled about that. Well, your breakthrough will be the neoclassic buttercream. Oh, well, I've always had the neoclassic back in the cake Bible, but now the mousseline buttercream is considered the queen of buttercreams. It's a, the perfect buttercream of choice for hot weather because it's made with all whites. The problem is, though, that it's a sensitive it's a sensitive recipe because you're trying to get Italian meringue, which is egg whites beaten with a hot sugar syrup, emulsified or mixed evenly mm-hmm. with the butter, and they want to separate. You know, and, so, and what you usually do is either heat it or need, or chill it. You take out about a cup and see which works the best. But sometimes everything fails, and then you just have to throw it out, or at least you had to. Because what we discovered is if we just drain out that sugar syrup and then beat the whatever is remaining of the butter and gradually add back the part that drained out, it's just beautiful. It's better than classic buttercream. Not quite as airy as if it had been done right in the first place. But the thing about mousseline buttercream is that if it should start melting on a really hot summer day, it doesn't fall apart. Once it comes together, it never really separates. So it's like a sauce. So it's very stable, even if it's a hot day, even if everything else is kind of melting. Exactly. (laughs) Yes. So this is really tragic because people in the past, they would, if they failed with it emulsifying and coming together smoothly, they just had to throw it out. And this will let butter. And it's such a, sh- a shame and a waste. If you're making a wedding cake, it's really drastic. So these kinds of things mean so much and are so exciting to discover. Yeah, one of the things I love about this book is that you don't really claim that every recipe is foolproof. There's kind of, like, you kind of anticipate there being problems even with recipes that could be a little bit fussy, recipes that could depend on humidity or temperature. And I love that you kind of have that built in. You kind of give people guidance on how to fix the problems. Thank you, because I think just about everything that can happen has happened to us over 11 books. But we haven't always had a solution to everything. And now I feel that we do. I can't think of anything that we have not solved that we're not offering solutions to. So thank you for highlighting that. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was fun running up the baking pearls as they are. Yeah. And also putting some solutions uh, to problems right at the beginning of each chapter. Mm-hmm. So you're identified right away that, oh, I better look at this first and see if something comes up along the way that I can solve right here. One of my favorite things, I think Woody also, about this book is that it's written exactly the way in which we actually bake. And I've never written a book like that before. I don't know why, but it just wasn't probably acceptable in those days to have something like a mise en place, which just means to prepare ahead. So the Cake Bible was the first book 30 years ago, the first cookbook ever to have charts. I don't know about the ones for commercial or for the culinary schools, but 
this had charts, it had ounces and grams, and my editor now allowed me to get rid of ounces, which are really so, un they're not imprecise, because when you round off an ounce, it's to the nearest quarter ounce, which is equal mm. to seven whole grams. And now you can get a scale that so easily converts one to the other. Plus, ounces can be liquid or weight. So fluid ounces, it gets confusing that they're not the same. We got rid of that. And so the first thing you see is the chart with all the ingredients. So you know what you need to have. Right after that, we have, or alongside of it, is the oven temperature in both Fahrenheit and centigrade. And the time, because if you're in the middle of a recipe, and you think, oh, I forgot how long it bakes for, you know, that you're looking in the recipe, where is it? Here, it's just right always in the same place. Next thing is the mise en place or the advanced prep. Soften the butter, get the eggs out, whatever it is you need to do ahead so that you're not struggling when you need it. Yeah, so to there's me, nothing worse than feeling kind of feeling a dough right. deflate or get mm. too glutinous while you're running around getting everything ready. Exactly. And then and you, want to, you want to blame the author. Why did they tell me that earlier? <laughs> <laughs> well, this time we did. But see, another thing is having all those step-by-step -step photos, to me, is the ideal way to have a book. I used to think a video would be really great, and we do have over 150 videos on the blog, which is nice to visit before or after you do a recipe. But during the recipe, you can't stop and start a video very easily. So having, I mean, some of the recipes are four pages of photos, which is great, but you only have to turn a page. You don't have to stop and start the video. And being able to have those critical steps means that you can streamline the text. And the perception has been in the reviews, oh, her recipes are now so easy. They were always easy. It's just they didn't appear to be. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was the perception. So tell me about the decision to photograph all the steps for this book, because that's a little new for you, right? as far as your other books are concerned? Was Actually, that a Anna, decision that, that your publisher made, or was no, that really? No, this was an amazing <laughs> thing that happened. In fact, we were having lunch at Gramercy Tavern. We were about to, do, to sign the Baking Bible, and we thought we'd be doing the Wedding Cake Bible, a book next, because it had been the book was too large, basically, and they had told us that we had a cut, which is always a terrible word to hear. Mm -hmm. So Woody came up with the idea that the most real estate is in the wedding cake chapter because there's so much information. So we'd take that out if we could have everything else, and they agreed. But when we were talking about the next book, which we usually do when we're signing the current book, my editor said, why don't you do a book for beginners? And I immediately winced because people have started baking from the cake Bible when they were 14 or even younger for 4-H and they won blue ribbons and their mothers wrote. You know, so mm -hmm. I thought yeah. younger people often do a better job because they're not thinking about what they can substitute. They actually follow the recipe. They're taking science classes. If they do substitute, they know better than to substitute more than one thing at a time so they know mm -hmm. what to change things. So as I was thinking all this within a one minute of time, it occurred to me, and I came out with the deal breaker I thought would be, is that, that um, I would do it if it could have a picture of, of all the critical steps of every recipe. And to my delight and my amazement, my editor said, sure. So Aww. the thing is, we had it's very expensive to produce a book like that. Plus, we had to find a top quality photographer who could come in under budget because publishers have a hard time. In fact, we ended up with 15, he took 15,000 shots. We ended wow. up, after he went through all the ones that he was going to weed out, we got it down to, was it 600, no, 700, 1,000? No. We didn't want to give up anything. He weeded it down about 2,000. Mm. We picked, we were, we, were, we were told 500 was the limit. That was it. Wow. Because we wanted big pictures. <laughs> How so, long did this but, take? But, How long were you shooting for? We shot for uh, about 17 days, wow. and this was uh, Matthew Septimus coming mm -hmm. from Brooklyn, driving all the way out to almost the New Jersey-Pennsylvania border to, to take pictures with us. Wow. Yeah, plus we needed to spend three days before every shot to get everything ready. We had to buy a refrigerator freezer to put in the garage and then rewire because we weren't expecting that. <laughs> so, what was the hardest thing to take photos of? You know, it sounds funny, but I would say caramel because... It's te temperature sensitive, so you don't want it to go over a certain temperature. And, and it changes the photographer visibly really fast. just with yeah. the... Yeah. Well, yeah, well exactly. then also he was doing down shots, mm -hmm. shooting straight down. Of course, you get steam coming up. Oh, uh, yeah, so, that was you know, challenging. Getting around that, but yeah, anything that was uh, you know, going from a, a certain liquid state to a solid state, something like that. Also, we had to get the right background because it was interesting that he was having problems with, I think it was a yellow cake, and he was doing a vertical shot. 
Oh, horizontal. That was it. And I got, I guess I wasn't impatient so much as I wanted to grab something on the other side of the cake. So I went streaking through in my black top. And I said, oh, my God, I heard the shutter go. I said, Matthew, I'm so sorry. And he said, no, that was the background. We have black. It's perfect. Uh-huh. I said, you'll have to take out the Nike. He said, don't worry. <laughs> you know, so Auto to a rescue. lot of fun <laughs> things happened as a result. And then the the end of every day of shooting, we would all sit down on the porch if it was warm enough and have all the desserts plus espresso. And Matthew would say, this is the happiest time of my whole life. Plus, he would get to take some home to his family, his two kids and wife in Brooklyn. So we we were friends from the start from years ago. You know, it just I knew that this is the soul of an artist and he did put his heart and soul into it. And that's why those pictures yeah, yeah. jump off the page. Which is pretty amazing because, uh, you know, stylists will be shooting usually, let's say, for two weeks solid. Well, that's a set budget, you know. Here and you know, maybe a thousand shots. Here he did fifteen thousand. Will down to two. We had to will down to twelve hundred, and we finally compromised with the publisher at about six hundred and thirty. Yeah, and so, the editor loved it so much, and she went through all of them and helped to say what she thought was most important to keep in. And then they added pages because they really saw that we'd done something, all of us, something extraordinary. Yeah. There must be, so you've been writing cookbooks since the 80s. There must be baking trends or techniques that really started with your books. Mm-hmm. Have you noticed that? The I mean, main can, one can is claim? weighing. Because I wrote an article for the LA Times Syndicate. I used to write for them for over 10 years, and I called it Way to Bake and Why It Was Faster, Easier, and Better. And little by little, Died in the wool volume people, <laughs> authors, especially baking people, would say, oh, no, it's more accurate to have volume because scales can vary too. And I would argue and argue. And finally, even they are putting weights in their books. So I'm very, very proud of that. That was the main trend. Also, with the Cake Bible, I offered to do that book without any royalties if I could have a picture of every cake. I'm so glad that it was not accepted because it's now in the yeah. 55th printing and it'll be a pauper. You know? <laughs> that was very ahead of its time, too, because for yeah. many decades, cookbooks really didn't have photos. Of That's food. right. In fact, when I was studying food in, at NYU, they said that it's better not to because people then feel they can't achieve what the photograph is. It's better to have line drawings, that the photos were fabricated. That was before that big scandal with the Campbell soup where they used marbles to make it look full. And now oh. it was, and then it became illegal, according to the USDA, to put anything in there that isn't there already. <laughs> you know, so that was really not a trend at all to have photos. And not only did I have one signature, but when the editor saw what I had done, I said, "Well, it's a pity because if I can only have one signature, which is eight pages, then I only put in the really beautiful ones. I'd like to put in the ones that are so easy to do that are more approachable." And so she agreed to put in another signature. But this is like a battle always to make the best book possible, especially if you're really writing something that's the definitive guide to cakes or pies or yeah, bread. Yeah, and you know the Cake Bible was just inducted into the Culinary Hall of Fame. You know the mm-hmm. ISCP International Culinary Professionals. Um, I forget what they call hallmark, I guess it is, whatever it is. The point is, it's past the test of time. And that's because right from the beginning, there wasn't a single mistake in the entire book. And my husband, who is a doctor, said medical books have a certain percentage. Every book has a percentage. And I thought, mine is not going to. I dictated the entire thing into a tape recorder, a thousand pages, and played it back against the galleys. And in those days, they had typists who were being paid by the page. It was an electronic. So I found so many mistakes, and I didn't let up until every single one was corrected. So uh, that's how the miracle happened, that it's it really sold by word of mouth, because people who couldn't bake in the past succeeded, because the rest, all the information was there. It might have looked intimidating at first, because there was so much information, but once somebody made something and found it worked, especially when they went by weight, there wasn't anything that would say, oh, it should have been 10 eggs and it was only two or something like that. With lamb chops, you know something's off. But yeah. with a but with a cake, you can't really tell sometimes. Or, you know, you usually can never tell. So that's yeah. why I didn't want to let people down. I remember in high school as a teenager making a key lime pie from the Pie and Pastry Bible. And it was probably one of the first times I had ever made a pie. But the instructions were so precise down to the temperature of the sugar, how it should look when you're folding in the egg whites. And it worked out totally perfectly I'm so glad every to time. hear because I think the whole thing that started my career was at the University of Vermont where we made a lemon meringue pie in class. And then I went to make it in the for the people that 
I wasn't living in a, an apartment, but my boyfriend at the time had his own apartment in a little house where there were four other people, and none of us had any money. So everybody contributed money to, for me to make this lemon meringue pie. After adding about two-thirds of a box of cornstarch and it still didn't thicken, I was so let down because it worked in class, and why would you need so much cornstarch? And that's when I started thinking, oh, what is wrong with this picture? What can I? How can I fix this? And I remember when I made spaghetti, it got all gummy, and so did rice. And I thought, I bet it's the water here. So on a scale of one to seven, I asked the owner of the house to have it analyzed, and it was eight. I mean, it was the highest possible water, hard water. Wow. And that was why cornstarch wouldn't thicken. So that's how I got interested in understanding the science. I mean, science can be off-putting. And when people after the cake Bible called me a food scientist, I would cringe because to me that was the antithesis of being thought of as an artist and being creative. But when you know the fundamentals of the ingredients, what's in them, and how things work, you can be as creative as you want to be, and it works. Absolutely. I, I, something I often hear is that everyone's cooking personality kind of fits either into the camp of really precise scientific baking or kind of like fun, creative cooking and improvising. Do you cook with the same kind of meticulous attention to detail as you do baking? That's a really good question. I remember once, I have two savory books that are no longer in print, but are available on Amazon. And I remember cooking from one of them. And I said to somebody, it says, and then I realized it is me. And I can deviate from what I said. <laughs> yeah, But I, it's true, though, I actually don't cook with the same precision necessarily, because I have more freedom. And that's what I like about cooking. There you have more of a leeway to change things. Mm -hmm. And as far as baking, I'm precise when I give instructions, but as far as doing it myself, I'm precise about giving the same amount of weight. For example, say sugar is one cup is 200 grams, and I'm putting 200, and it's 201. I'll make it 200 because... I've been one, there <laughs> many times. Because where do you draw the line? If you start compromising, and that's why I gave that quote from Colin Powell in this book. I don't know if you noticed it, but it was. I was so pleased that they allowed me to put in a quote from someone who is not in... It was far from a baker and mm -hmm. maybe a militarist, the militariness of baking. <laughs> but he basically said, I can't quote him exactly word for word now, but it's the small details that make the difference. And if you compromise on those, you're going to compromise on the larger things, too. Mm -hmm. And when I teach younger kids to bake, I remember my friend Elizabeth Carmel, who's a colleague who writes grilling books. And when I was teaching her young nephew, who's very, very bright, about counting, because I don't like to use a timer if it's just a minute. I think it's easy enough to count by the time you turn the timer on, it's already half a minute. So we were going one and two, and, and he said, if you count faster, will that work? <laughs> and I said, I'm always thinking that myself. I wish it would. But yeah. see, the thing is, baking is the ideal lesson for kids because you're learning everything, philosophy, science, art, patience, what else? What else? Mathematics? Mathematics, mm -hmm. yeah. Taste. I gave my nephew years ago when he was visiting from California, and he was a little boy playing with his friends, and we were going to Balducci's, and he said, my mom likes glasso water. And I said, New York water is, is rated as the top water in the country. I'm going to do a blind taste test. So I got the little boys and me, and we all did a blind taste test, and we all preferred the New York water. Oh. I mean, this is such an instructive thing for people. But nowadays, if you want to do that test, you have to let the water sit overnight because they put more chlorine in. So oh. you're, until it dissipates, you taste the chlorine. Um, I noticed that you're very specific in the at, in the front matter of your book about what kind of equipment and baking pans people should have. I noticed that you recommend Nordic Ware for bunt pans, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Why so specific about that one? Cheap, mainly because they you the ones we generally suggest are their cast <clears throat> aluminum pans, which are just they just bake very well. You know things come out very well, and they're also very well coated uh, for pretty much an easy release, and they're pretty much indestructible unless you start banging them on the floor. <laughs> put them in the dishwasher because <laughs> they are aluminum, but they're heavyweight aluminum, so they yeah. conduct the heat well. Yeah, because they're and cast. they're not dark, so that they don't overbrown the crust. Okay. And also, I like the fluted two pans because I don't like to put a lot of buttercream on cakes. Mm -hmm. And the basic layer cake, yes. But I love cakes that don't need buttercream because they're moist and they have beautiful decoration just from the pan itself. Absolutely. In fact, in the equipment, since it's a basics book, I wanted to give the most basic equipment, the, the things that without which you really wouldn't want to bake. 
And I think probably the first one was the thermometer, even before mm-hmm. the scale. An oven thermometer? or a No, a, uh, a lot of oven thermometers aren't accurate. And mm. I have a, a different way of figuring out an oven temperature, if it's accurate or not. And that's, since I've tested the recipe so many times, if I say it takes 20 to 30 minutes and it takes 35, I know it's not going to set the same way, and I know the oven is off. So I'll turn up the thermostat. If it's really off, you have to have it recalibrated. But usually, the only time you need to recalibrate an oven is if it's been moved. Once it's installed and the calibrator is done correct, calibration is done correctly by the calibrator, it should hold very well. But it's Point and, one point and shoot, that's a nice one to have too, but that's a luxury. The instant read thermometer. And I happen to love the thermopan. It's very expensive, but it's so quick to respond. That, and that makes a difference because if you're doing a sugar syrup or caramel and you want 370 and it takes five seconds, by then it'll be 400, it'll be burnt. So it's very hard to do it by eye. I mean, you're making a sugar syrup, you can say amber, but unless you have a light-colored spatula, you can't tell in the pan when it's amber. Right. So there are many times you really want to know the temperature. Yeah. What's a slightly unnecessary, kind of frivolous kitchen tool that you love having for baking and that you wish more people would buy? Probably an induction burner. What would you say, Woody? I have so much equipment, it's hard to <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm an equipment junkie. In fact, I no produce kidding. my own line of bakeware, uh, like ideal silicone spatula and the pie kit with a surface that's pretty much nonstick. So it's most nonstick and a rolling pin of the same sort. So I'm a, an equipment nut, but I didn't even put a rolling pin in the basics. You could use a wine bottle if you had to. Yeah. So what was it? what would you say is the luxury thing? I wouldn't call it a luxury thing, but just the... What's the that you could live without, but oh yes, the bench scraper, uh, the uh, yeah, so flexible, flexible pl- uh, bench scraper, bench, bench scraper, because you can, you know you don't think of it, and it's so easy for like clean out the poles and everything else. And people yeah. consider it like the chef's right hand or extension yeah. of his hand. Oh, and now an induction burner basically is a, a surface that you plug in that just gets to a very specific temperature, right? That's how it's different well, than a stovetop. It's not so much that as that it heats by magnetic induction, so you need to have pans that will work with it. But when I make sugar syrups, I especially love it because the sides of the pan don't heat, so it heats very evenly. But you do have to turn it up and down. It, it's not quite as controllable as I would like it to be. Like if simmer is not is usually too fast or not enough, it has a way to go. But I like I, it's my first choice when I'm heating most things in the kitchen. Including like melting chocolate, I could see it being really useful. Only if it is really low. But nowadays you can melt like a wonderful Breville oven, countertop oven Mm -hmm. that will go down to 80 degrees, I think it is. You can use it to proof bread. You can also melt chocolate. One of the great discoveries I made, I don't know if I put it in this book, and it's it's either going to be a blog posting or already has been, is you can melt dark chocolate in very low heat without stirring. But either milk or white, the milk solids will clump and you cannot unclump it. But if you come, if you do it at a low enough temperature under 100, you can do it. Even the companies told me you couldn't do it. So that was a major breakthrough. I've always been of a mind that when I'm told I can't do it, unless I'm told why, I'll, I'll try and find out why or if you maybe can. Like I remember years ago, people said that you cannot make ganache, in, and people didn't even know what ganache was, in a food processor. And ganache is simply dark chocolate with a heavy cream in it, sometimes a little butter. And I thought, gee, it often separates when the heat is too high and the cocoa butter comes out, then you have to try to reincorporate it. What if I were to process the chocolate and add the boiling milk, or not boiling, but just brought to a boil? Mm -hmm. It it never separated. So that's why I like making rules. I don't like following them unless I'm sure of I understand why. And that's why I like to tell people the reasons for what I do, because these things could change. Ingredients change, and and methodology and equipment changes, which enables you sometimes to do things you couldn't do before. Absolutely. One last question before I let the two of you go. If readers were going to try one recipe from this book this weekend, what should they try? What do you most hope people will give a chance Can we each give a choice? Yeah, I would love that. For me, it's the triple lemon bundt cake. Sounds great. Somebody that I'm very fond of and who's written a beautiful book, Cenk, who wrote The Artful Baker in Turkey, when he he put on his blog, Cafe Fernando, he put on that uh, it was, he never wants to taste 
he, no, he never wants to even look at another lemon cake again. And I'm the mother of the cake, so I feel that way. But I was shocked that somebody else, especially a colleague, would feel that way. So I think it's a real game changer, and I've given it in many different sizes. If people don't have the particular pan I mentioned, they can do it as two smaller ones or as loaf pans. So that, to me, is my first choice. And you're not sick of lemon cakes, even after all these years. This is it. I mean, lemon is my favorite flavor, but the cake is soft and moist. And also, uh, it, it has a crunchy exterior from the crust, and then the powdered sugar lemon glaze on top. So you have three different consistencies of le- and flavors of lemon that just satisfy, to me, everything I'm looking for. Yeah, it keeps it exciting. Yeah. What about you, Woody? I would say Rose's pie crust recipe, or cream cheese with cream and butter pie crust Ooh. for flaky, you know, more, more flaky fruit pies, etc. What does the cream cheese do to the pie crust? Well, primarily it's flavor. And it also gives it a more tender texture. And my goal was to make a pie crust that people could reproduce because they seemed, from what I hear in, in class when I taught, people feel pie crust impaired. I even designed a pie plate, it's called Rose's Perfect Pie Plate, that has deep fluting so that when you press the crust in, you automatically get a beautiful side border and it has nowhere to go but down, so it keeps it. Whereas you can make a really nice raised border and it flattens out in the oven. But the flavor that cream cheese gives makes it my favorite pie crust, hands down. And yes, I'd like to be a pie crust missionary, and sort of we have, because we've been making it around the country for several years now, and show people how easy it is to make your own and how much superior it is to anything you can buy. Yeah, I can't wait to try that. Thank yeah, for the you holidays. so much for joining us, Rose Thank and you. Woody. Thank you for inviting us, Anna. Here's Matt with Mississippi Vegan author Timothy Packron. Timothy Packron, thank you for joining the Taste Podcast. Thank you for having me. I love your book. It's it's a really interesting concept, uh, the Mississippi Vegan. Thank you. Yeah, it's a missing link. <laughs> the missing link. The missing link that I have linked now. Well, today, officially, it's linked. Yeah, I think, honestly, when you think of Mississippi cuisine and Southern cooking and veganism, you, you obviously don't necessarily think of the two as being cognates, but you write so beautifully about how veganism is part of the Southern American table. Totally. Well, I think people just compartmentalize vegan and they just assume that it's either difficult or weird or not good. When in actuality, people have been eating vegan food their whole life. They just haven't been calling it vegan food. So, you know, when you eat oatmeal or apples or, you know, a vegetable soup, lentil soup, pasta, bread, that's vegan. You know, it's just um, I'm just trying to show people that there has been this undercurrent of veganism that exists within all food. But in particular, Cajun, Creole and Southern food. And that's precisely what the book's about. And I love how you say celebration of, an, of abundance mm-hmm. is really what the South is about. And, totally. And truck farming is a big part of Mississippi and Southern culture and mm-hmm. just amazing produce. Is that a big part of the book, produce? Yeah. I mean, I moved to Jackson, Mississippi to write the book. And I'm from Gulfport, which is on the coast. But the farmer's market in Jackson, I was so proud And pleasantly surprised because there's young farmers there that are growing really cool produce. And there's not a lot. There's like four or five. But it's enough to have a really good, you know, farmer's market, which is like the source of Mississippi Vegan. Mississippi Vegan really represents that abundance of of plants, local produce, and mushrooms. And the farmer's market there had everything that I could have wanted. And I was really surprised because I was living in New York and I would go to the Union Square Farmer's Market probably three times a week. And that taught me so much here. So when we talk about the, f- the farmer's markets in Mississippi and we're like, let's, let's just picture we're, we're there right now. It's, it's October. What, what's in the market? What, what's, what's seasonal right now? Well, so right now you're going to have your root vegetables. I know that there is persimmons are abundant. The radishes, there's some radishes that are just starting back up because they're usually in the spring, but they come back in the fall. You have the fall tomatoes, and then you have your greens and your cabbage and your squashes, the hard winter squashes, yeah. the delicata, the acorn, and um, and then there's some cool squashes. I know there's like a 
there's a lot of weird heirloom squashes that come from Georgia and Alabama that most people don't have access to. Are so. they weird in a good way though? They're yeah, like delicious. sugar, like uh, like a sugar uh-huh. squash where it's like it's really long and a weird shape, but it's like really sweet and delicious. So. That makes a great roasting squash when you have that sweetness totally. with all that. We put a little olive oil in there. Cauliflower, broccoli, romanesco. That was what's interesting is when I moved there, like they had green meat radishes and they had, you know, romanesco, like that green cauliflower that looks crazy. Yeah. They had those things and they had watermelon radishes and, and um, you know, unique herbs and heirloom okra and, and just interesting things that um, that really, that's what really the South means to me. Always growing up, I was attracted to those things. I was attracted to, you know, the corn pudding or just the hearty, a hearty vegetable soup or fried okra or even fried pickles. And even with the gumbo, like I liked the gumbo for the texture and the flavor and because it had rice and not the seafood beautiful or se- and dewy part of not, it. Yeah. I mean, of course, like I'm not going to say I didn't like that flavor. Yeah. But it's funny because when you make gumbo, it's really vegan up until the end, and then yeah. you throw in the sausage of the seafood. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's a good point. It's true. It's just funny. So if you just leave it out, and then if you put like a cool mushroom, or a, you know, even like a hardy winter squash, or yeah. you know, just more okra, you just you still have this beautiful gumbo. It's not a hard sell. Well, it's funny. I just when you say vegan gumbo, people like I'm automatically just like get defensive. It's like you don't know what you're talking about. Exactly. The word you're... gumbo means okra. Like it, shut up. It's so true. <laughs> shut up. <laughs> like get over yourself. <laughs> I love it. You you lived in New York though. You talk about that. You, you're a successful artist. You're you had gallery. Successful. I don't know if I. Would. All right. I would say struggling to the max. Credit card debt from framing all the pieces of artwork. The galleries yeah. were damaging the frames. Never selling enough artwork to get ahead. Okay. I just wanted to be creative. I wanted to be creative. I wanted to yeah. to show my work to the world. And the art world is just. It's all politics. It's all about where you went to school, how much money you have, and who you know. And. I just like I wasn't cut out for it. Is that what sent you back to Mississippi? That was what I was going to ask you. No, that's what that's what made me focus on Mississippi Vegan. Oh, okay. So I started Mississippi Vegan in New York, ah. and when I created that concept at the time, I didn't even know it was a concept, but it really is a concept of me ending my time as a art, quote unquote artist, what I thought was an artist, and expanding that. Let's talk about home cooking and, and, and really what makes a great vegan homestyle recipe. What makes a really great vegan homestyle recipe is one that everyone can try and love. And you're not talking about the fact that it's vegan. You're just talking about the fact that it's delicious. And it's a recipe that you put, you put time into and you put love into. And not everyone does it. But when you have a recipe that someone really puts love into it, you can tell. And it's a really magical thing. And so I think you have to put that love into it. And you also have to remember that if you're making a traditional recipe, it's not successful if you're just removing components. You have to replace that flavor or that texture. So... And that's precisely what I do with the recipes. I replace the flavor and the texture. So you don't feel like there's anything missing. You have that complete satisfaction and it's ultimately enjoyable. I wanted to walk through a couple of the recipes that really stuck out in the book. Um, Walk me through your your vegan southern biscuit recipe. I mean, you think of biscuits as as light and butter. You think Mm -hmm. butter and lard. Butter and lard, yeah. But how do you make it work? It's it's so funny because you really just need a shortening and you need a butter. And it's 2018, people. There's vegan butter on the market. Like, get over and it. And it's good. They're, it's good. Yeah, 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 Yoko's yeah. butter is delicious. Yeah. They have earth balance. They have melt. They have all kinds. And in Europe, there's a whole different, you know, branch of vegan butter. And it's all getting really good and it's getting better. So you use that vegan butter. I use coconut oil mm-hmm. as a shortening. I just make sure that it's hard so it's not liquid. And... You just add flour, baking powder, baking soda, salt. I add a little bit of nutritional yeast because it gives it a little savory umami. I knew it was going to come up. Nutritional yeast. Oh, my God. It's the best friend. It is the vegan secret weapon. It really is. The vegan secret weapon is nutritional yeast. Um, And you'll learn that in the book. (laughs) Because it has glutamic acid. So it's just that savory deliciousness. So put a little bit of that. And... 
Yeah, I cook it at a really high heat, just like traditional biscuits. And I use white lily flour, southern white fluffy flour, and it's completely vegan and it's delicious. I bet. I can't wait to make it. And then there's another biscuit too. Oh, cool. There's like a red lobster biscuit. Oh, shout out. I love yes. those cheddar. <laughs> I didn't want to oh. say it in the book because I didn't want to be tacky, but there's totally no. the red lobster garlic well, it's cheese. On biscuit. the record now. And what I put in that to make it really moist and decadent is I use a coconut yogurt. Oh, that's excellent. Because coconut cool. milk has just that high fat content. Yeah. So that's a great replacement. And you don't use too much because you don't want it to taste like coconut. Yeah. So there's just a little subtle coconut tang. But with the garlic, it just, you know, it it's just hit it hits all those those um textures and flavors that you want. Let's talk about the vegan Caesar Caesar <laughs> salad. I love it. How do you replace the anchovies and the cheese in a Caesar salad? Mm-hmm. I'm really intrigued, and I bet you can do it. I mean, I know you got the recipe. Well, when I watched Julia Child make a Caesar salad, I noticed how simple it was. She made a really delicate garlic crouton where like you mince the garlic and you cook it in the oil and then you toss it in croutons. And then you just use really good like baby romaine. And the dressing is just egg yolks and some anchovy. It was so simple and good oil. And so what I used... To give it a depth of flavor, I used roasted garlic, and then I used a vegan Worcestershire, which hits that anchovy kind of tang. Um, And when you mix that with Colin Amok, Colin Amok is a a black sea salt. It's actually not a sea salt. It's a black salt, and it has naturally occurring sulfur. And this stuff tastes just like an egg yolk. You can just buy that on Amazon? Yes. Okay. And you can go to my website, and I have a a product page where I recommend it. And but you can just you can find Colin Amok at any um, they actually have it Indian markets or health food stores. Anyways, it's like a fine powder salt, but that with fat really gives you that yolk flavor and texture. So with a base of a vegan mayo and Colin Amok and blended up roasted garlic and a little Worcestershire, you have this beautiful dressing that's thick. And when you toss it to lightly coat the romaine leaves, I mean it really. It's satisfying. It sounds and I amazing. Put, I put fried capers on yeah. top with croutons to just seal the deal. You just need that extra like boost right at the yeah, end. Extra little with capers, boost. yeah. And especially because you know because you're not using egg yolk and anchovies, and you're, you're getting close, but you're not. You're not. Like, it's not the exact same thing. So the fried capers and really good croutons really kind of takes it over the edge. Beautiful. Uh, I had another one that I just am intrigued by, fried popcorn tofu po'boys. So you've got a couple <laughs> things going on here. You've got the, the po'boy mm-hmm. vegan style, which is challenging, and I'd like to hear about that. But then like the idea of fried popcorn, mm-hmm. to take us through that dish. Well, I said popcorn tofu, just like you know KFC's popcorn, popcorn chicken. chicken. Just small, right? like, so, yeah, it's yeah, a small yeah, yeah. Like, p- pieces of, um, but fried popcorn does sound good, but... <laughs> Yeah, I was like, okay, and now, like, wait, now we're clear. Go okay, I got it. Yeah, it's just fried, like it's just small pieces of tofu. Yeah, that um, and I didn't want to put a lot of fried food in the book because that stinks up your whole house. Mm. So you really just you kind of pan fry it in a skillet and then you finish it in the oven, and that kind of gets it crispy and it makes the tofu chewy, which is really what we're looking for. We're looking for a chewy protein because at the end of the day, a po' boy is really fluffy kind of cheap bread which is what we want for a bow boy shredded iceberg lettuce tomato pickles mayo so you just use vegan mayo you still got the shredded lettuce the tomatoes and then you just need that protein because traditionally in new orleans you can get a roast beef po boy hamburger po boy or most popular like a fried shrimp fried uh, crawfish so you really can use whatever you can use fried mushrooms you can use fried artichoke hearts you can use jackfruit i mean really you can use whatever I have a great like mushroom barley sausage that would be great in the po' boy. But we're just looking for for that like the bulk of a po' boy actually is vegan. Yeah, yeah. So it's just that protein. And so, it needs to be fr- like kind of fried and like with that great texture too, right? So it's so fried and I put the old bay seasoning which makes everything taste like shrimp like Seafoody, perfect, delicious flavor. And Old Bay is vegan. Yes. Oh, whoa. That's what's so funny. Bury the lead there a little bit. That's, That's what's pretty so cool. funny. All of these traditional, like Southern Cajun Creole foods, they taste the way they do from the plants and herbs and seasonings yeah. that people are using. That's that's why it tastes that way. If you take a chicken breast and you boil it in water, you don't want to eat that. You want to eat it when you put lemon and garlic and oregano and black pepper and sea salt and a little splash of soy sauce and vinegar. Those are all vegan, honey. So good. <laughs> <laughs> well said. 
I want to know about let's let's shift to restaurants because I think our our listeners are always interested in, in trying out vegan re- restaurants. So do you have a couple favorites in New York, Charleston, New Orleans that you want to shout out? Okay, so this past Sunday, I went to Kajitsu, which is a Japanese Buddhist vegan restaurant, Michelin star. And I got the prefix menu, $125. You get nine courses. And it was amazing. They had fried maitake mushrooms. And they had all kind of um, just interesting herbs. They had like ginkgo nuts. And they had persimmons were on the menu. And then they served this rice dish that they shaved black truffle over. So they, they really celebrate plants and mushrooms in a beautiful way. And it's um, I highly recommend it. You have to make a reservation, though. And that's in Manhattan. Yeah. Give us one more recommendation. I'm trying to think. Um, in New York? Or... It could be in Charleston or in New Orleans and anywhere. You know, New Orleans has a fun new vegan restaurant. It's called Sweet Soul. And in the South, they have these like buffets that have collard greens and cornbread and mac and cheese. Meat and three places. Yeah, and, 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 and barbecue. And there's this family there that opened up a vegan like Cajun Creole buffet style restaurant. And it's it's just it was so refreshing to walk in because every time I see that buffet at a grocery store, I'm like, God, I wish I could just go get some fried okra and like, but you know, buttered corn and green beans, and they have that, and it's really fun, and it's um, it's it's just it's also like this nice shining light that New Orleans is really transitioning. New Orleans has so many more vegan options now. I'm actually putting together a blog post to recommend all the places because I have one for New York actually. I have a blog post that recommends all my favorite New York places. But, um, yeah, I think it's a really cool sign to see that New Orleans, which you wouldn't think would be vegan-friendly, is now becoming really vegan-friendly. Timothy, thank you for joining the Taste Podcast. Yeah, this has been a blast. The Taste Podcast is hosted by Matt Rodbard and me, Anna Hiesel. The show is produced by Gabrielle Lewis, studio recordings by Pat Stango, theme music by Steve Rydell. Interviews are recorded live at Books Are Magic in Cobble Hill, Brooklyn, and at Penguin Random House Studios in Manhattan. Visit Taste online at tastecooking.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.